Our next topic uh, is uh, sleep, which we'll be breaking down into a couple of different parts. We're first going to take a look at the impact of uh, sleep, uh, sleep deprivation uh, on behavior. Uh, but we also want to understand the context of sleep. Uh, that is how important it is for our normal uh, everyday uh, functioning. So um, let's uh, proceed along with an examination uh, of this uh, so uh, critically important aspect of our, uh, of our everyday living. And I hope that by the end of this lecture, you uh, will have a renewed focus uh, on uh, getting enough sleep because it, it indeed is uh, such an important part of our everyday existence. It's as important as eating healthy, uh, getting enough water, having enough activity. Um, so um, to begin our assessment, you know, one of the things that I do is I, I like to ask students how much sleep they got uh, last night. And oftentimes what I get back from students is not very much. Uh, indeed, oftentimes what I get is that they uh, probably got in the neighborhood of maybe four or five hours. And I can tell you that's simply not enough and you're putting yourself um, at great risk. And behavioral neuroscientists really have been on the front line of front lines of trying to understand um, um, sleep and, and how essential it is uh, for our everyday existence. So some important facts uh, about sleep that I want you to be aware of um, as we're going along. Uh, we spend, <clears throat> you know, roughly a third, um, you know, 30 to 40 percent of our of our lives uh, in sleep. Uh, that's a lot, and um, it's been only re uh, relatively recently that we've come to understand more uh, about sleep uh, and how very important it is. I mean, when you think about it, you're spending you know, a third of your life in sleep, yet we don't really know um, all that much about it. Uh, secondly, um, adolescents especially don't get enough sleep. Uh, you know, study after study has come out, some, some of which we will review, indicating that you put yourself at uh, incredible risk um, in terms of your health uh, by not getting enough sleep. And certainly the, the risk factors uh, extend not only to our physiology, but um, our behavior. Uh, and third, um, I think that in some cultures, uh, not having enough sleep is really seen as uh, almost a badge of honor. Um, I hear over and over again, especially from young people, that sleep is for losers and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, they absolutely need good sleep in order to function uh, normally. And lastly, uh, think about this for a few moments. We are immobile uh, and unconscious for, let's say, eight hours a night. That's when you're sleeping. Think about how vulnerable you are during that period of time. I mean, truthfully, if someone could do something to you, great harm to you, and you would simply not have time to react. Um, so um, it, it, Try to think about this in terms of evolutionary terms. Why is it that evolution put us at this uh, incredible risk every single day, you know, for seven, eight hours uh, a day? Um, it must be awfully darn important for us to get sleep in order for evolution to put us at that risk uh, day after day after day. So. Uh, sleep has a lot of different purposes. Uh, some believe that uh, it's there uh, uh, principally involved in conserving energy. Some believe that it's involved in repairing our body, restoring our body. Um, there's evidence also to indicate that sleep is important for uh, how we go about consolidating memories. Um, we'll take a look at that research when we get to the whole area of learning and memory. But um, it has a variety of different very important functions. Uh, if we go uh, back uh, into the 60s, uh, some really interesting research that was done over in the uh, Soviet Union um, by researchers who examined what happened when um, you did not allow uh, laboratory animals, rats, 
uh, to sleep. And what they would do is uh, when they saw that they were starting to uh, fall asleep, they would simply pinch their tails, uh, which would wake them up. Um, and what they found is that after doing this for five days, uh, animals started to die. Uh, so sleep absolutely is essential. Uh, and indeed, um, as we go along, I'm going to make the case uh, even more as to how critically important it is for you to get good sleep. Here is a distribution uh, of uh, sleep times uh, by species. Uh, this is uh, mammals uh, that you see here, and you can see that uh, um, you know bats uh, get a lot of sleep, almost 20 hours a day. And at the other end of the continuum, uh, the horse gets probably the least amount of sleep, 2.9 hours. We're right up here, about eight hours uh, a day, which is a moderate amount of, uh, of sleep. But there are species who get more and uh, mammalian species that get more, some that get less, but we are the only mammal that uh, oftentimes purposely deprives ourselves uh, of sleep. It's a very interesting research by Matthew Walker at Harvard Medical School in which um, he looked at uh, college students um, and what happened when they got, uh, when they went for one night without any sleep. Uh, and he examined it in terms of their ability to learn certain, you know, very easy uh, memorization tasks. And what he found is that subjects are 40% worse in memorizing a list of words uh, if they did not get uh, 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 any sleep in the previous 24 hours. And one night of really good sleep actually improves memory. So this is research, uh, just a small part of which shows over and over again how uh, important sleep is. So what Matthew Walker has said is that certainly, um, you know, practice is important <clears throat> in how we go about learning and uh, retaining you know, what it is that we practice, but with a night of sleep, that makes perfect. You know, one of the things I always tell my students is that if they want to perform well on examinations, one of the worst things they, that they can do is to stay up all night um, and study uh, before uh, an exam. That simply is, it, you're doing a lot uh, more harm uh, than you are good by engaging in that kind of practice. So uh, one researcher, David Dinges, at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School has done a lot of studies in which he's utilized a uh, technique which is called chronic partial sleep deprivation, in which he keeps individuals awake until 4 a.m. and then around, lets them sleep uh, until 8 a.m. And at 8 a.m. he wakes them up. So they're only getting four hours of sleep uh, a night. So when we take a look at the results, uh, what Din just finds is that there's uh, problems in terms of attention, problems in terms of memory, problems in terms of uh, our speed of thinking, uh, problems in terms of alertness uh, and reaction time. And here's, the, here's the, probably the single most important factor. It accumulates each day. So in other words, um, one day it's bad, two days, it gets worse. Three days of partial sleep gets worse. Four days of partial sleep gets worse. Five days of partial sleep gets even worse, right? So it accumulates and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, many of you may be familiar with this phenomenon. Um, uh, probably the leading cause of accidents today is people falling asleep at the wheel. And one thing <clears throat> that uh, uh, individuals oftentimes engage in when they haven't had enough sleep is something that's called micro-sleeping, where uh, just for a few seconds, um, they, uh, or a fraction of a second, they may fall asleep while they're driving and they go off, can go off the road uh, uh, or go off uh, into another lane, and hit an oncoming car. Um, uh, People who engage in this, um, oftentimes they try to keep themselves awake by turning up the radio, uh, maybe rolling down the window of the car, 
uh, maybe slack, slapping themselves in the face uh, in order to stay awake, but none of it works. Uh, and indeed, uh, lack of sleep is considered to be one of the major causes of uh, car accidents uh, today. Um, some world famous accidents due to sleep impairment, the Exxon Valdez, Valdez oil spill in Alaska, um, a huge uh, environmental um, uh, disaster uh, that occurred. And it was a result of the fact that the captain of the ship fell asleep uh, and the, uh, uh, the boat, uh, the tanker uh, ran aground. Uh, another uh, certainly uh, uh, hor uh, horrific uh, accident at Chernobyl uh, in the Soviet Union <clears throat> a number of years ago, the nuclear meltdown uh, that occurred. Um, this, uh, when you take a look at the logs and the records of the management team uh, at the time uh, that was maintaining you know, Chernobyl, um, a number of them had been sleep deprived. Um, the Three Mile Island disaster in Pennsylvania from uh, a number of years ago, uh, the near nuclear meltdown. Uh, this too, you take a look at the, the uh, logs that were kept uh, by the uh, managers uh, on board at that time. And uh, many of them, um, uh, you can clearly see, uh, had not uh, <clears throat> gotten enough sleep. <clears throat> Staten Island ferry crash um, from um, a few years back in which I believe it was 10 or 12 people were killed and another 20 or so very seriously injured. Um, you know, the, the captain uh, had, had fallen asleep. Uh, so indeed, you know, these are terrible accidents as a consequence of not getting enough sleep. Uh, when you take a look at brain responses, um, to disturbing pictures, a, a picture like uh, this that you see right here. One of the areas of the brain that really responds a lot is in the limbic system, and it's called uh, the amygdala. Here's the amygdala, here's the amygdala here. And um, uh, uh, Matthew Walker has been studying uh, brain responses to disturbing pictures like that in individuals who have had enough sleep versus those individuals who have been sleep deprived. And the MRI show uh, hyperactive responses in the amygdala of sleep deprived individuals. Um, it's almost similar to what you would see in individuals suffering from psychiatric disorders. Um, the MRIs uh, of subjects that had a normal amount of sleep show that there was a modest kind of controlled response that occurred uh, in the emotional part of our brain, in the amygdala. The rational part of our brain simply doesn't keep the more emotional part in check uh, in the case uh, of uh, individuals that have been sleep deprived. So if you take a look at the neural responses in the amygdala of normal and sleep deprived subjects, this is, what, uh, this is what you see. When you show them a disturbing picture in an individual that has been sleep deprived in the amygdala, you see this um, uh, very um, uh, uh, heightened level of amygdala responding in comparison to an individual who's had normal sleep, where you get this more modest, controlled kind of a response. Um, in a 1960 study, uh, it was shown <clears throat> that the average American got about eight hours of sleep. Um, the 2010 study uh, showed that uh, it was about 6.7 hours. Um, we're trending downwards uh, in terms of the amount of sleep uh, that we get uh, each night. So the future of sleep research uh, certainly has very important implications for our understanding of psychiatric disorder for, for mental disorder. Uh, and this is now one of the first things that they look at in individuals uh, that are uh, suffering from some kind of mental illness is you know, how much sleep that they're actually uh, getting because it can be a major complicating factor in the etiology of their disorder. Uh, altering the quality of sleep, um, some really interesting studies that have been done on deep sleep uh, deprivation. Uh, there's a, a theory um, that, that you know, some of the problems that we experience with advancing age may be related to the loss of deep sleep. 
and again that's something that we'll talk about in different stages of sleep uh, in our in our next lecture um, but we lose deep sleep uh, at a very early age uh, if you're a young person you're healthy generally you're getting about 100 minutes of deep sleep uh, a night uh, older people, um, you know, from the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth decade of life, only get about 20 minutes uh, of really deep sleep uh, a night. So, if you deprive an individual of uh, deep sleep uh, after four successive nights, uh, researchers have shown when they do PET scans. Um, that the, the subjects really aren't metabolizing sugar very effectively at all and, and there's very high risk for uh, type 2 uh, diabetes so this is some of the research that is emerging now uh, as a consequence of um, uh, uh, the impact of sleep deprivation uh, Emma Van Cotter um, uh, researcher um, at the University of Chicago uh, Medical School. She's an endocrinologist and she's really done some wonderful research in this area, um, taking a look at sleep uh, and how it is associated with health problems. And she's used that same paradigm that David Dingus has used, the partial sleep deprivation. And what she finds is that there's a pre diabetic state that occurs in just six days of uh, partial sleep deprivation. And one of the things that we know is that uh, in individuals that are sleep deprived, they tend to become hyperphagic, that is, they, they overeat. And one of the reasons for that overeating has to do with uh, the hormone leptin, which we'll be talking about when we get to the area of hunger. This hormone uh, uh, signals the brain to eat. That is, when it gets very low, when it begins to drop, it's more or less telling your brain it's time to eat, you must eat more. And one of the things that happens with this sleep deprivation, uh, partial sleep deprivation, is that individuals become very hungry. And uh, indeed, it's a major risk factor for the development of obesity. Uh, so more recent studies now have shown that um, um, uh, obesity is uh, very much related uh, to, to lack of sleep. Um, uh, lack of sleep is also related to heart disease. It's also related to a higher than normal incidence of stroke. So this is uh, uh, certainly, a, um, you know, very concerning. And I would make the argument that uh, sleep really affects everything. Uh, and look no further than some of this really interesting research that was done by Scott McRobert at St. Joseph's University where he explores uh, in the fruit fly uh, sexual behavior and in particular male sexual behavior. Here's a male fruit fly that's mounting a female fruit fly that you see right here. Here's the behavior patterns that you see uh, where the male first orients towards the female, begins to sing a song and uh, flap his wing, uh, then begins to follow the female, then uh, starts to lick the ventral area of the female, then copulates with the female, and after that um, uh, the female rejects the male and she won't uh, be cooperative anymore in terms of his uh, attempts to engage in reproductive behavior. But what happens when McRobert <laughs> takes a fruit fly, a male fruit fly, and he prevents the fruit fly from falling asleep? Well, what happens is all these very interesting behavior patterns that you see that ultimately lead to sexual behavior, they don't occur. And males that are sleep deprived uh, don't engage in, in sexual behavior with a female. Um, so, you know, I hesitate to extrapolate too much from uh, uh, from fruit flies, but I think the message is that uh, normal male sexual behavior really uh, requires um, um, uh, normal amounts of sleep. Um, in our next lecture, we'll take a look at some of the interesting work that has been done on the biology uh, of sleep and different stages of sleep. So we'll look at that uh, in our next lecture.